pastor asked me several weeks ago, a couple, actually a couple months ago by now, uh, if I, I would uh, give him a break. Uh, it, is, it is a struggle uh, to, to put together a sermon uh, all the time, regularly. And uh, part, of the, part of the biggest struggle is what you're preaching on is convicting you the whole time you're, you're trying to, to, to gather it in. So I, I decided, what, what in the world should I talk about? And Well, the whole idea of sanct- the process of sanctification, what's it all, what's it all about? And um, we, we, we're going to end up eventually in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, but we have a few stops to make before that. Uh, let's, we like to start in Philippians chapter 2 and just read verse 12. Now, I'm, I, I noticed on the, when I was putting this together that I would be copying and pasting from the New King James and if I just wanted to type the uh, verse uh, out of my head, it would be in the in the sixteen eleven version of King James. But we we were reading in the the English Standard version, but it's the Word of God. But second or Philippians chapter two, verse twelve. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now stop there for, for the moment. One of the things that we hold true, I mean, this is, this is for the folks that might be interested in the, in the membership class, but we as a church hold true. I mean, Brandon holds this. This, this, these particular doctrines. Terry held these before him. Uh, I do. Mark taught on these things as well. Um, and those of you who remember Larry, Larry uh, spoke on them quite a bit. It's, it's the doctrine of salvation that came out of the Protestant Reformation in, 16, in the 1600s which had its initial formulation in the church fathers, particularly uh, St. Augustine. And we believe strongly that was first taught by Paul in the epistles. And these doctrines are called uh, the doctrines of sovereign grace. And one thing, if you notice a lot of the songs, if you notice at the very bottom of the first song, uh, many of them are from Sovereign Grace Ministry. And it's the idea that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, that we have no part in, in anything that affects our salvation from, from God's foreknowledge through His election, His calling, His predestination, and all the work of justification. I know all these theological terms are, can be a little confusing, but all that work is done solely and completely by God. We can do nothing but add sin. For him to forgive. God graciously works by himself to provide salvation and bring us to glory. We can't even exercise true faith, truth saving faith, until God first works 
in us. Well, if, you, if you're interested, you can write down in your notes and look these verses up later. But John 6.44, the Lord Jesus says, No man can come to Me except My Father. Now all the translations will say, draws Him. But if you do a little bit of word study, other places in the New Testament where that Greek word is used, it's translated drag. And the Greek word really means to, to overcome with greater power. No man can come to, the, to me except my Father drags him. Very interesting words. God works by Himself to secure our salvation. By the way, this is a minority report among Bible teaching churches in our day. And we won't get into all the theology here, but somebody would say, well, if that's true, why does Paul in this verse that we just read say, work out your own salvation? Doesn't that lay a responsibility on us? Three things to notice. First of all, Paul is not saying work for your own salvation. He says, work out your own salvation. Second thing to notice, it says, your own salvation. You already have it. And the third thing to notice, the word that is translated work out doesn't mean to bring it forth, but to finish it. To bring it to its total fulfillment. I already alluded to Romans chapter 8. For whom He did foreknow them, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son. Whom He predestinated them, He also called. Whom He called them, He also justified. And to those and He justified them, He also glorified. The golden chain of salvation. God will actually do the last step in the process of sanctification, which is glorification. But from the moment we are justified until our last moment on this earth, we are to work out, bring to fulfillment, or bring it to its logical completion, our Salvation. In other words, we stand perfect before God. Not only are all our sins are forgiven, for which we praise the Lord. We sing about that all the time. But also, when God justifies us, He imputes Christ's righteousness to us, so that we stand before God not only totally sinless, but also perfectly righteous before God. That's our position. But what is our status? What is our state? Could anybody say with Jesus to people who really don't like us? Which one of you convinces me of sin? I don't think any one of us would have the audacity to say something like that. Because, quite frankly, it would be quite easy to point out our sins. So 
So what Paul is teaching in Philippians is to work out, to bring it to its ultimate conclusion, the salvation that God has given to us. Now, the question is, how do we do that? Particularly when I recognize I'm still a sinner. Well, we want to look at two passages uh, in, in this process. Actually, we're going to look at several. But a couple of weeks ago, after Brandon had asked me to, to teach today, I asked my, uh, the theology class, what is the difference between Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, and 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 7? Everybody know what the uh, Galatians uh, 5, uh, 22 and 23 is. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. Against such there is no law. But what was the passage that Josh read for us, 2 Peter. Therefore, add, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. Does everybody see the difference? One, in Galatians, it's God developing, working in us to produce this fruit. But Peter talks about us adding to our faith. In other words, there's responsibilities. The difference is, Peter focuses on what God expects us to do in our sanctification process. Paul uh, focuses on what God works in us while we are doing what He requires of us. Now, if you were here on, uh, on uh, good, the Good Friday service, Brandon gave us a, a, a big theological term. So I'm going to do, use a couple of big theological terms too. Now, uh, don't fall asleep. The difference is, okay. When God works by Himself, this is what we call monergism. Made up of two words. Mono, meaning one. And the word erg, which means to work. So monergism is one person working. God works monergistically in our lives to bring about, to bring us to justification. However, once we get, once we're justified, once we stand before the Lord and He's done His work in us, He does give us a responsibility. He, ex he wants us to work on sanctification together. That's called synergism. Now, I'm sure everybody knows, has heard the word syn synergy. We hear that a fair amount in our day. Again, it's two, two words. The prefix sin not, it's not S-I-N, but S-U-Y-N. means with. And again, the, the word erg, meaning work. So, more than one person, or more than one individual, works 
to bring about our sanctification in this life. Two working together. In other words, as we are giving all diligence, as Peter says, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and virtue knowledge. As we are giving all diligence, we're working with fear and trembling, as Paul says here in chapter in Philippians 12, God's going to be working all the time within us to bring about His fruit. Now, there are some Christians who say that sanctification process is you let go and let God. Well, that's not what you get out of Peter. Nor is it what you get out of Paul here. Notice what he says in the end of verse 12. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That doesn't sound like let go and let God to me. It sounds like this is an important issue and you better pay attention to it and you better work at it with all diligence. Now, we can be sure that God's going to do His part. I mean, God did it all to bring us to salvation. God's going to do His part in working in us. But what's our responsibility in this? So let's turn right now to over to 2 Peter chapter 1. And let's take a look at this one step at a time. And I shouldn't use that word step. For the rest of the message, I do want to focus on 2 Peter and explore what God expects of us. It says, add to your faith virtue. Now, we spoke on this a little bit a couple of messages ago when I was speaking. But there are three ways that the Bible uses the word faith. When, when, during the Protestant Reformation and, and Martin Luther particularly was, was uh, debating with those who said yeah, he, he was an antinomian, he was, he was uh, a, a heretic teaching false doctrine, and an easy believism, and this, this, that, and the other thing, he said, they would always say, faith without works is dead. And, and uh, Brandon has, has addressed that several times. And the shorthand answer that, that Martin Luther would say was, yes, we're saved by faith alone, but not faith that is alone. It's always accompanied by works. And he brought out the point that there are three ways that the Bible uses the word faith. In Jude chapter 3, or chapter 3, you'd have a hard time finding chapter 3 in Jude. But in verse 3, Jude talks about the faith once delivered unto the saints. And he's referring to to the body of doctrinal truth that makes up the Gospel, that includes the Gospel. That is a group of facts. And we, in order to truly be saved, we have to believe the truth. I mean, we all believe that uh, Joe Biden is is the President of the United States. That that is a truth? Or we believe that George Washington was the first president of the United States? That is a truth? That doesn't save. 
So there are specific things that we must believe in order to be saved. The fact that, that I'm a sinner, that Christ bore my sins on, in His body on the tree, that if by solely trusting in Him for my salvation, I will be saved. God will save me. So there's content in what we believe. But knowing those things isn't sufficient. It's the first step, but it's not sufficient. Second thing, another word, uh, another use of the word faith refers to mere mental assent to a fact. In Mark 9, 19 through 24, the, the man who had whose son was, was possessed of a demon. And the disciples tried to exorcise the demon and and the demon just stuck his tongue out at the, the other disciples. And the Lord Jesus came and Jesus said to the, the father asked the Jesus. Help my son. And Jesus, can you, can you help him? And Jesus said, yeah, I can, I can help him if you can believe. And the father said, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. He had a belief. It was a mental assent. But there's something that needed to be a little bit more. And that's what Jesus was trying to bring out for that, that man. Mental ascent is important too. Because we have to believe what we, what we say. Those facts. But that's still not enough. An atheist knows, can know the Gospel just as much as you do. That doesn't save him. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord Jesus says some of the scariest words in the Bible. Many will come to me in that day saying, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name done many marvelous works. And I will say to them, depart from me, you that work iniquity. I never knew you. That individual that the Lord Jesus has to say that to believed, quote unquote, in Jesus. He thought he was serving the Lord, but in doing it in his own way and in his own fashion. There is a third way, there is a third use of the word faith. Galatians 2. Verses 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works lest any man should boast. God, for true saving faith that a person has, God has to work it in us. He has to change us from the inside. But when that happens, when that person com first comes to Christ, I know from personal experience, they're an ungodly sinner. An ungodly sinner whom God has made spiritually alive, working saving faith within them, forgiving their sins, imputing the righteousness of Christ, and several other doctrines that deal with with justification. We start this new life in Christ with no godliness of our own except the faith that God has given to us. And that promises that God will lead us along in a lifelong, arduous, and sometimes exceedingly painful path. Of sanctification.
the Christian life, if anybody tell, if you hear anybody saying the gospel, say, oh, your life is going to be wonderful. Your life is going to be happy and, and whippy. Don't believe them because they'll lie about other things too. Not every, the Christian life is not always rainbows and sunshine. There are times of that, and we praise the Lord for those times. But there's also times of deep discouragement. There's also times of frustration. There's also times when you're confused. Lord, what are you doing? And the only answer you get when you ask that is, trust me. Trust me. But to start down this path, Peter tells us, and let's move over to, to 2 Peter. Again, chapter 1, starting in verse 5. But forgive for, for this very reason, giving all diligence. Again, you see the, the effort that is involved in this process that we're expected. Add to your faith virtue. What is virtue? It's right living. Where can we define a where, where can we find a definition of right living? I mean, if you read the media, you're not going to find a very very virtuous life. I mean, nowadays everybody's confused whether I'm a boy or a girl. And you can make your choice of whether you're a boy or a girl. Uh, I don't think that's very virtuous. Or you can make your choice of, of who, whether you marry a, a, your own gender or somebody else. Or, or the, that's not virtuous. But if you, you bought it, if you get your standards by the word, by the word of this world, you're going to get that. Where are we going to find a description of that? You can start in, actually in the law. Now, you know, wait a minute. I was once discipling a young man who stated that since we're under grace, we have nothing more to do with the law. I said, what? What are you talking about? Yeah, we're under grace. We don't have to keep the law. Oh, you believe um, under grace, on perfect position, now I can sin with Jesus' permission? It doesn't work that way. What is the law? While it's true that I cannot keep the law to, to gain righteousness, but the law is also among many other things a description in very practical terms of what of a life that pleases God. And one of the things that really mark a true Christian is an overwhelming desire to please God. The simplest illustration of that is, is a married couple. Is it your desire to please your spouse. It should be your overwhelming desire. One other thing that I brought up to this young man. When you get saved, are you under the, the new covenant? Brandon's been talking about this quite a bit. Are you under the new covenant? Oh yeah. What does God do with the law under the new covenant? In Jeremiah 31, he says, I will write my law on their hearts and put it in their minds. God doesn't forsake the law. 
Because again, it is a very practical description of, of what pleases Him. Now, living in accordance with the law pleases God. Now, do you think you can, you, you can use the law to, to persuade God how holy you are? No, it's not going to work that way. But to start down this path, we begin to add these, these qualities. And we make every effort to gain a knowledge of God's Word in partly in the law. Now, ask a question. If you only had a glass of milk one day a week, would you end up being very healthy? I don't think so. In fact, I think you'd be pretty starving. Well, you know, for those folks who only go, whose only exposure to the Word of God is on Sunday morning, that's what they're getting. One glass of milk. And remember, what, what is milk? It's pre-digested food. You know, the cow ate the grass and the hay and it, it produced milk. And we milk the cow and we bottle it and everything. And we partake of it. It's pre-digested food. What's a sermon? It's the Word of God that's been pre-digested by the pastor. And you're getting the, the, the pre-digested form of it. What am I getting at? Each and every one of us need to take time daily in the Word of God. Not merely reading it. Reading it is a good thing. But studying it. Let it meditate on it. Dwell in it. Have a feast with the Word of God. Add to your faith virtue. And to virtue, knowledge. Now, the word translated knowledge here is the very, it's a very general word, a Greek word, for, for knowledge. And when I'm interpreting it, the Word of God, whenever I see a word with no qualifiers, I tend to give it its broadest interpretation possible. In other words, during your path down the road towards sanctification, learn everything you can about every subject that you can. When I was saved back in 1976, I was an evolutionist. And it took about five minutes of reading the Bible to know that what evolution taught and what the Bible teaches are totally incompatible. They're mutually exclusive. And it's been... I've enjoyed for this many years to not only study and read the Bible, but also study and read various topics on various sources. Like many of you know that one of my favorite things is to teach from the book of Genesis. And there's a lot... What the, one of the reasons that I'm going to, uh, uh, to Cleveland later today to view the, the eclipse is to view the majesty of God. And then to do that, you have to learn a little bit about uh, astronomy. 
And it's a marvelous thing. I, I read in the paper t- this week that there was a, there was a uh, thing. It, are, are, is the earth the only planet with eclipses? No. All the planets have eclipses, but they're either, either their moon is in such a position where it, it's only very, it doesn't totally blank out the sun, or it's totally it's over total, so you don't really see anything. Only the Earth has the proper relationship between the the moon and the sun. Just to give you a little quick quickie there, the sun is four hundred times bigger than the moon, but it's also four hundred times further away. So, both the sun and the moon have the same appearance in the sky, the same size in the sky. So that when the moon does pass through the, the sun, it is, and this particular eclipse, we're at the exact right point where it will cover the actual disk of the sun, and all you'll see is the corona of the sun. And I'm praying that the Lord is gracious and keeps the clouds away in Cleveland. Because I wasn't going to fly down to the desert southwest to see it and be pretty well assured to, to, to have clear weather. But there's also several other facts about the relationship between the earth and the sun and the moon that are absolutely vital for for life to exist on this earth. If this I'll just say this real quickly without any details. I just get started talking about this stuff and can't shut up. But if the sun, if the moon didn't orbit the way it does, and it's a it's the only moon there's over 170 different natural satellites of the, of the various other planets in the solar system. And the moon is the only one with a unique orbit around its Earth. If you want more details, I'll tell you afterward. But if it wasn't for that unique orbit, it maintains the 20 three and a half degree uh, angle of the earth's poles to the sun, which gives us our seasons. If it wasn't for that, the other planets, the gravitational pull of the other planets would cause the earth to go all over the place. 90 degrees to to 23 and a half degrees and back. What would that do to life on earth if for a while the, the, the uh, equator of the earth was in the poles, in the polar regions? It would kill everything. Anyway, have to move on. Add to your virtue knowledge. It is a truism when you say, all truth is God's truth. Because God not only made scientific things that we find out scientifically, God made the universe. If something is true in the universe, even though the Bible doesn't really talk about it, it's true. It's God's truth. But that truism has been abused. Because not everything that our world says is true is really true. Every, measure everything that you hear and learn against the Word of God. Be a Berean Christian. 
Anybody know what a Berean Christian is? Acts 17.11 But they that were in Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica because they received the Word with all readiness of mind and searched the Scriptures daily to see if it is so. Also, Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5.21 Prove all things. Hold fast to what is good. And to virtue, knowledge. And to knowledge, self-control. Now, I've been wondering about... One of the things I was wondering about as I was studying this passage is why did Peter pick out these particular characteristics? Maybe it was what he used during his growth as a Christian. Because... Second Peter was written shortly before his death. And he went through quite a few trials, um, not the least of which was denying the Lord and the brokenheartedness that he felt because of that. And the Lord graciously restored him to fellowship. But I can understand, and I don't know if that's exactly true, but I can understand this particular characteristic. What was Peter like? By nature, he was outgoing, outspoken. He was very gregarious. He was impetuous. He was domineering. And it's easy when, to see when this type of personality is around, they can overpower a group of people. Have you ever known those, that kind of individual who comes into the room and instantaneously everybody, whether they want to or not, demands to be following him or her? Excuse me. Don't believe everything I say about the water. So he had to he had to learn self control. He had to learn. You know, there are times when it's better just to shut up than to keep running your mouth. But you know, self-control can work the other way as well. Someone with a personality that is more shy and retiring and who would rather remain in the background, that person's self-control would be to be a little bit more outspoken. So they have the opportunity to minister to others. Self-control is not only something that we are to work on, but is also one of the fruit of the Spirit. Again, in Galatians 5.23. Often we may not have a good enough understanding of ourselves. And we should work on it. But don't worry. God's already working on it. To knowledge, self-control, and to self-control perseverance. This is where life can get really tough. Have you ever felt like God was beating you up? Just hitting you with one problem after the next, after the next, after the next? Putting you through the ringer. By the way, how many of you know what a ringer is? And this is spelled with a W and not an R. My grandmother, when I was growing up, my grandmother lived down the street and she had an old, old washing machine. There was a big tub in there that did the wash and then there was a small spin tub right next to it and above that was two rollers. And there would be a crank on the side and you would take 
what comes out of the, the wash and put it through the wringer and it would squash the excess water out of whatever you were washing. Did you ever feel like you were squeezed in both positions from all directions and you can't figure out what in the world God wants? That's the ringer. Life becomes so hard, such a squeeze on you physically, emotionally, financially, you just feel like giving up. Just remember Job. Though He slay me, yet will I trust Him. These are times you dare not give up. Because remember, God is in absolute control of everything. Every minute detail. When He says He knows the very number of hairs on your head, I mean, beyond the literalness of that, which He does know the number of hairs on our head. Beyond the literalness of that, He's telling us every minute, insignificant detail of our lives, He is in absolute control over. There may be times when each of us face truly devastating conditions in our lives. And as I was, well, how do you handle it when a spouse or a child would get brutally murdered and the the perpetrator goes free? Just think think of that thing. And as I was writing that, I thought, How did Mary feel standing at the foot of the cross seeing her son brutally murdered, belittled, spat upon, rejected, whom she knew was was, was the Messiah? And Simeon's words came true. Yea, a sword will pierce your own soul also. How do you handle that? How how can you endure? Ask yourself, do I believe Isaiah 45, 7? The Lord says, I form the light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I, the Lord, do all these things. Things. That's a hard word. And when we're going through it, they're even harder. Then you ask yourself, do I believe Romans 8.28? We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to His purpose. Do I believe that? Can I believe that with those circumstances? That's tough. If all you have is God, then God is all you need. Anyway, time is going past here, and I keep going, going on. Let's skip down. I want to finish up with a few things to note about this. I have more notes on the rest of the topics, but first thing, this list of character traits are not steps in a procedure. So that you would say, well, well, I I start with faith and Now I'm going to work on virtue. I'm going to work on virtue for the next three years, and then I'm going to work on knowledge. And then I'm going to work... It doesn't know. It's all together. 
They're a picture of a lifestyle that we are to develop. Second point thing to remember. All the while you are seeking to develop this lifestyle, the Lord is working in you to bring about the fruit of the Spirit. As you are working, so God is working. And thirdly, we want to stop with this. 1 John, let's turn to 1 John. Chapter 3. <clears throat> we'll start reading at verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. So just stop and think about the awesomeness of that. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are the children of God. And it not, has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him. What's the end of this path that we're going down? Christ likeness. True Christ likeness. And I hope that's every one of our heart's desires. All the rest of the things aside, true Christ likeness. And what does John say in verse 3? Everyone that has this hope in Him purifies Himself even as He is pure. It's an effort. It's a responsibility. We're going to fall. We're going to stumble. But God's going to pick us up. Amen. We'll move on to our communion service.